All right, now, if you didn't catch a little wind from the prayer right before I was getting ready to preach here, you know, we started off in Matthew chapter 2, great chapter um, on the birth of Jesus Christ and the three wise men that came. Now, this morning I preached a sermon giving lots of honor and respect unto Jesus Christ for dying and paying for our sins and for, you know, being born and, and um, you know, really just spent a lot of time kind of putting all the focus on Christ for doing that. So, I do think that's very important. That's why we did that this morning. But if you missed this morning's sermon, this evening sermon is not a Christmas sermon. But we did read all of Matthew chapter 2. We're, I'm going to be looking at one verse out of, out of Matthew chapter 2. But uh, just in the spirit of, of, of Christmas here, I figured let's just go ahead and read the whole chapter. But um, turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter 6. These sermons are necessary from time to time. It's not um, the most pleasant of subjects. Uh, hopefully you get, a, get motivated and stirred up a little bit and that we can all be on the same page when it comes to, to this issue because um, it's a serious one and it's an important one and it's something that's been getting worse and worse um, in our, not just in our culture, but I, I think even worldwide. This is something that just, as the world becomes more wicked, there's been a lot more problems and there's, there's pushes from the world and ultimately it comes from Satan himself, but to try to get people used to and comfortable and tolerant with, with sin and with really, really grievous sins and with really, really wicked sins that are trying to be normalized and pushed upon us. And we need to be aware of this. We need to be weary of this. And the, the title of my sermon this evening is Choose a Side and Get On Board. We need people to get, get on fire, get motivated, get sold out for the Word of God. To do work, to do God. See, what, what happens is the, the wicked are always going to be pushing their agenda. Always. It's always going to be an attack. They're always going to be trying to do more to, to just defile more people. Because that's what the wicked do. That's what they're about. That's what Satan's about. He's always been about that. And the problem is, is when people who are believers, people who know the truth, people who believe God's word, don't do anything. Don't do anything. You may believe right. You may know what's right. But no one's standing up to this, on, this onslaught and this assault from the wicked and, and no one's standing up and saying no and shouting no. Hey, we're not going to tolerate this. You're not going to push your agenda any farther. We're actually we're going to push our agenda, we're going to push the truth, and we're going to try to get people to turn back to the Lord and say, the Lord is our God, that, Lord, that the Lord might bless us once again. You're in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 explains that we are in a spiritual battle. There is a battle going on. This is not just, you know, we live our lives, we hope, you know, Start off young, maybe get married, have a family, raise some children, you know, get older. But that's not what this life is all about. Hey, those are great things. Praise God for them. I'm glad God gives us those gifts. I'm glad God gives us family. I'm glad God's given me children. I'm glad for all of these things. They're very good things. But there are so many more things that we need to be thinking about and focus on and be aware of and know that, hey, if you're born again, if you're a child of God, you're in a fight. There is a spiritual war going on. Now, we are not aggressors. We're not going out looking to pick fights with people. That is not our spirit. That's not what we're trying to do. But we are definitely going to defend the faith and we're going to defend purity and we're going to defend righteousness when the attacks come. And the attacks have been coming really hard. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10. The Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. We need strength. Too many Christians, say, too many believers don't have the strength because they're not putting on the armor of God and they're getting run over, literally just run over spiritually because you know, maybe they themselves aren't living that righteous of a life or that holy life and they, and they feel like a hypocrite and they don't know what to say and they're not going to speak up and say anything against all the wickedness that's being promoted and crammed down everyone's throats because they themselves don't feel like they could say anything. They're not strong. They haven't strengthened themselves in the Lord. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. This isn't a physical fight. We're not going and I'm not going to go home and get my AR. We're going to go out. And we're going to go make things right. That's not, that's not the battle we're talking about. Okay? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And there's a lot of darkness in this world. And they are our enemies against spiritual wickedness in high place. This is who our fight is against. This is identifying the enemies. And we need to be able to identify spiritual enemies. Because in this verse, it doesn't flat out give you names of saying, well, this is your enemy, this is your enemy. We need to be able to figure that out. We need to be able to identify who are the real enemies. Who are the wicked people? Now, you go all through the book of, of Proverbs and I understand, and you, you have to understand this, okay? In one sense, we're all wicked because we're all sinners, right? We all fall short. We, we know this. But when the Bible, especially like in the book of Proverbs and some other places, talks about the wicked, like, like there's certain people that are wicked people, that's not a reference to everybody. The, Prover the book of Proverbs really talks a lot about the wicked person who you know, sits up at night just devising mischief and, and, and thinking about how they can hurt people. Those are wicked people. People who are planning and plotting to just do harm, to do bad things to people. Those are wicked people. They're wicked down to the core. The Bible also refers to people like that as children of the devil, children of Belial, people who are just so rotten. You know, look, your average unsaved person, I know before I got saved, I wasn't just out to hurt people. Was I a sinner? Of course I was a sinner. Did I do wickedness? Yes, I did wickedness. But there's a big difference between someone who's just, you know, unsaved, but going through life, trying their best, doing whatever they can, and someone who's just plotting and planning really evil, bad things, okay? And we need to be able to identify this and not just soften it down and make it not sound so bad and take these predators, wicked predators, and just maybe label it as something else. Oh, they had problems when they were a kid or they had this, or they have that, and just, and just try to downplay how extremely wicked and bad and, and dangerous these people really are. Because when, you're, when you do that, you start to let your guard down, and you're going to start just inviting or welcoming these people in, and you're not vigilant to be on the defensive and, and to be ready to stand and to stand in the battle when, these, when, the, when, the, when the fight comes. Now, um, Herod is a good example of someone who was an enemy. We started out, we read the whole chapter in Matthew chapter 2. And what did he do? When the wise men came and they were seeking to find, hey, where is Jesus, right? Where is the Christ? They, they, didn't, they didn't know his name of Jesus. They're looking for, you know, we saw the star. Where's the Savior born? Where's the King of Israel? Where is he? And Herod caught wind of this. So what did he say to him? He said in, in Matthew 2 8, you don't have to turn back there. If you want to, but he said, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word, ag word again that I may come and worship him also. He's being sneaky, right? He's being tricky saying, oh, hey, hey, go find him. And when you find him, come back and just, just let me know because I want, I want to go and worship him too. And this is just one of the tricks that wicked people will use to try to gain confidence and say, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm with you. I want to worship Jesus too. I want to worship the king. I'm with you. you know, just, just tell me where he is. And what, what was his real intentions, the real motivation? He wanted to kill him. He wanted him destroyed. Because that's why when they were warned of God and they didn't go back to Herod, this wicked, I mean, think about how wicked do you have to be to go and be responsible for the murder of all the children in the area, two years old and under. That is evil. That is pure wickedness. Herod is an enemy. And he's not to be treated as someone, oh, well, he's just misunderstood. 
oh, well, we just need to invite him into church and show him our love. No, he's wicked. I don't want that guy anywhere near my children. He's out to, to be a prey on children. Now, he was out to kill him. He was out to kill the Lord Jesus Christ as an infant. Wicked, wicked, wicked man. And because this battle, there, there's Herods all over the place. This isn't just something that's unique that happened back during the time of Jesus Christ. This is going on all throughout history. There is spiritual wickedness in high places all over the place. And this is, the, this is why we can't have people sitting on the fence and being kind of wishy-washy. And, you know, yeah, I'm a believer in Jesus, but you guys are real extreme. Yeah, I'm a believer in Jesus, but, you know, I kind of just like living my life and not offending anybody and not having any problems. And you know what? You're going to do nothing for God when you're wishy-washy, when you're not plugged in. We need more people to get plugged in and contribute to this fight. We need more people just to say, you know what? I'm on board. I'm getting in. I'm going to choose a side and I'm going to be part of the team. Let's all make a group effort here. Join forces, join together and stand for God. Let's let Jesus Christ be our leader. Let the word of God guide us and boldly stand together. Look, we need each other. You cannot fight this battle alone. This is not going to be something that you're not even going to be able to stand. You need people. Now, we have the Lord. If everyone were to forsake you, God forbid, you would still have the Lord Jesus Christ. But what's going to make you a lot more likely to withstand is, is being involved, being in the group, being among God's people, like-minded believers to, to share our troubles with. Because when one person's going through a hard time, hey, you've got a lot of people praying for that person. You've got people calling that person, hey, how are you doing? And ready to lift them up and encourage them and edify them. And we do that for each other within this church here. Because let's face it, the, the, the more on fire you get, the more you change your life and change your priorities to get in the word of God and to stand for him and actually start doing something and start winning souls and start really getting involved, you're going to face opposition. You're going to face hard times. The Bible says, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That will there means you want to. I want to live godly. I want to do what's right. I want to get the sin out. Hey, I want to serve God and do something great for the Lord. When you want to do that, you shall suffer persecution. It's not you might suffer. No, you shall. It's going to come. It will happen. We need to be strengthened. We need to be united. We need to be just a family here and ready to help one another out. But the decision's yours to be all in, to be part of the team. In Joshua, turn if you would to Mark chapter 9. I want you to turn to Mark chapter 9. I'm just going to read for you a real famous passage in Joshua. End of the book of Joshua, right? Children of Israel, they got into the land. Joshua led all these great battles. They had all these great victories. And in Joshua 24, verse 14, the Bible reads, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which our fa your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He's saying, you know what? You just choose, you decide. If you think that it's evil to serve the Lord, if you don't think it's right, if you don't like God, if you don't like the God of the Bible, then go ahead and find some other God, you know what? And go serve them. Go get on their team. Go over there and go ahead and do it. He said, you know what? We're doing no. Me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. That's where I'm at. And of course, the people answer, oh, no, no, we're going to serve God. We're going to serve the Lord. We need people to make that decision. Say, you know what? I'm going to serve God. And notice he said, serve the Lord. He didn't just say believe in the Lord. 
Now, of course, you ought to believe on the Lord, but I'm speaking to people who believe on the Lord. You already believe on the Lord. Let's serve the Lord. Let's do something for God. It's not enough just to believe on him. It is for your salvation, but it's not enough. That's not what God wants for you. He's created you to do good works. He's created you to do more. Once you've become in his family, once you're born again, you're a child of God. Of course, you're always a child of God, but hey, he wants you to be a good child. He wants you to be a productive child. I want my children, look, my children are my children no matter what, and I love them no matter what. But I want my children to grow up and to do great things of their own. I want them to be productive. I want them to do something. I want them to serve. I want them to work. That is going to bring me the most joy. When I could see my children doing right and serving the Lord with all of their hearts. And that's what God wants for us. For his belief. He, he wants you serving him and doing the work he's laid out for you. Let's not be unproductive. You say, you're crazy, Pastor Bersons. I don't know why I even come here because you're always saying we need to do stuff for God. Hey, the Bible says that we, sh we should offer our bodies a living sacrifice. You want to talk about extreme? Oh, you're extreme, Pastor Bersons. Then the Bible's extreme. Fine, I don't care. You can call me whatever you want to call me. But when the Bible says, hey, we ought to order our offer our bodies up as a living sacrifice to God, which is our reasonable service, he says that, that's not extreme. The Bible says it's not. The Bible says that's reasonable. Why is that reasonable? Because God paid for every single one of your sins. God saved you from an eternity of hell. Hey, it's only reasonable that you would say, okay, God, you saved me from everlasting destruction. I'll offer up myself to you. Here I am. Use me. I'm willing. That's what we ought to do. Hopefully I had you turn to Mark chapter 9. Now I want to explain this because there are people, I, I want everyone, I want people to get on board here. I'm preaching to people here. I want everyone on board here at our church. But you know what? There's other people in other churches that are out there serving the Lord and God bless them. God bless them. There's people that are serving the Lord that are friends of mine or friends of our churches that, you know, think real close and real like-minded with us. God bless them. You know what? There's other churches. They're not quite on board with a lot of the doctrine and some of the things that we teach, but you know what? They're still on the same team. They're still winning souls. They're still serving God. They're still doing something and serving God. You know what? God bless them too. They don't all have to be like Word of Truth Baptist Church. Okay? I don't expect them to. Not everyone's going to join our church. And you know what? That's fine. Look at Mark 9, verse number 36. The Bible says, And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name, receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me, receiveth not me, but him that sent me. And John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us. And we forbade him because he followeth not us. But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me, for he that is not against us is on our part. So we need to have this attitude of just understanding. Look, and, and this, is a, this is a situation where we're saying, if you got someone performing miracles in, in Jesus' name, it's legit. He's serving God but he's not following with your group. He's not attending your church. He says, don't forbid him. Don't tell him to stop. Hey, go ahead and serve God. Now, it probably would have been best for this person to join up with the apostles and with Jesus, right? I mean, it probably would have been the best place for him to be, but so what? If he, if he doesn't do that, don't forbid, don't tell him, hey, don't do that work. Don't do the good, the good work for God. Don't, don't be you know, casting out devils. Don't forbid him. They're on the same team. That's what he's saying. He said, they're not against us. He's on our part. He's, he's, he's helping out. He's working. He's doing the right thing. There are those that are with Jesus and doing a work for Jesus, but they may not be following certain men, but they're still gatherers. I'm going to read this verse for you in Matthew 12, 30. Jesus also said, he that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. So we have two concepts being presented here. One is, hey, if they're not against us, then they're for us. 
But that was in regards to someone who is doing miracles and doing work for Jesus. Okay, this isn't just talking broadly about everybody. He's talking about someone who's actually out there doing work. Hey, don't forbid that guy because they're not working against us. They're for us. But then you have him saying, if you're not with me, because this guy, he wasn't following with the disciples, but he was still with Jesus. He was still doing work for Jesus. He was doing good things and he, and, and he was you know, performing miracles in Jesus' name. And he's saying, they can't just easily speak evil of me if they're doing that. So he wasn't the enemy. But Jesus said, he that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. He's saying, if you're not gathering, if you're not doing something, he said, you're actually scattering. Scattering is doing more damage and more harm. And this guy, even though, you know, so there's lots of people, they may not be part of our church or even part of our movement, right? But they're still gathering. They're still doing the work. They're not the enemies. We're not going to say, hey, you can't go so, you know, go so, you know, praise God, go, go do the work. We're not going to tell you not to do work. Of course, do the work. And they're not our enemies, but we also need to be aware of those that are not really on our part, but just say so. Right? Like the Herods. This is who we really need. And this is what I really want to focus on is just being able to identify the wicked people, the Herods that say, hey, I want to come worship him too. Hey, I'm on your side. I'm on your team. And invite them in when they have wicked intents in their heart and they're out to destroy. Because Herod was out to destroy him. And it happens, and they, they sneak in privily, the Bible says, and they are the true enemies. You're still, hopefully you're still in Mark chapter 9, verse number 42, because Jesus continues in, his, in what he's saying here. And he, when he brought the child in the midst of them, and, and he said, hey, if you receive one such little child, my, you know, it's like you're receiving me. And, and, and Jesus has a real special place in his heart for children and for the fatherless and those that can't defend themselves, those that have no advocate to speak for them. God has a, a very special place for people like that. And look at what he says here in verse number 42. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, one of these little children that believe in Jesus Christ, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. Why? Because what he's going to do to him is worse than, I mean, think about that. Getting, getting a big cinder block, a big millstone wrapped about your neck and just being tossed off into the sea to drown. He's saying that's better. That's a better fate than someone who's going to offend one of these little ones that believe in me. We see the protective nature of Jesus Christ here, especially over the little children. And we need to have that protective nature over our children in our church. We've got, we have a small church, but we have a lot of kids running around here. And we need God to help us protect them, but we need to be wise ourselves. We don't want to let the Herods in that are out to destroy the kids. There are people here that, that they're just not allowed. Anyone that would go after children is our enemy. Anyone. I mean, and, and, you know, this should be common sense, right? But you know what? It's not these days. You know why it's not? Because you have people out there starting to say, you know, they, they're getting you to accept already. Oh, love is love. Oh, accept our sodomite marriage. Oh, accept our, our homo same-sex marriage and our love and all stuff. And if, if a man loves a man, hey, just let him get married and everything else. Just accept it and, and cram this down your throat. Something that is against nature, something that is wicked, something that is vile, something that's abominable according to God's word, not the way that God designed us, completely against God, completely against nature, getting you to accept that because because you know what the next step is? Oh, well, that was just my choice. Oh, I, I, I mean, this is the feelings I have. These are, they're my feelings. They must be right. You must let me just do this. Now they're starting to say, oh, well, I'm attracted to children. That's just the way they got me. I don't know. This is just the way I am. And, and hey, I love them. And they're going to say, they love me. And you know what? You think that's crazy? It's already happening. It's already happening. That's why you, there's been groups like, what is it called? NAMBLA has been around for, for decades. I don't even want to repeat what the words stand for because it's disgusting. It turns my stomach. And I don't even know what, I don't know what the first two are. Is a national something of man, 
boy, love. It's sick. It's wicked. And anybody that is drawn to children like that is a wicked person. Wicked to the bone. Wicked to the heart and are not allowed here ever. They're an enemy. Even if a person doesn't directly go after children themselves, but they're supporting those that do, they're supporters of that move, they're supporters of, hey, you know what, I don't do that, but hey, I'll help you out. They're an enemy too. When it comes to, when it comes to what we're trying to do and to serve God, I don't want to have anything to do with the homo sympathizers. I don't want to have anything to do with these people that, that, that are shedding tears and supporting wickedness and vile abomination. I want nothing to do with you. Nothing at all. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 19, turn if you would to Romans chapter 1. 2 Chronicles 19 is the story, and I, I went over this already. We went through our first, the books of 1 and 2 Kings. King Jehoshaphat was a king of Judah. He was actually a good king. He was actually a good guy. He actually served the Lord. He was doing things that were right. He did a lot of good for God. But he yoked up with wicked Israel. Israel at the time was very, very wicked. They were not serving the Lord. They were serving false gods. Okay? And Jehoshaphat decided, hey, I'm going to yoke up with you. I'm going to team up with you. I'm going to fight your fight. I'm going to help you fight your battles. And they were a wicked nation. And he was joining forces with wicked people. Wicked King Ahab. And he was rebuked as a result. In, in, in 2 Chronicles 19, 2, God sent a messenger. God sent a man of God to rebuke him. And this is what it says. It says, And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly? He's saying, Should you be going out and helping the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. He's saying, you're going out and helping these ungodly people and you're loving those that hate God. What side are you on? As a result, hey, God's wrath is on you now. We need to be on the right side. Hey, you're a believer, right? You're on the side of Jesus Christ, amen? Yes. Amen. Let's not support the enemy Let's not be funding the enemy. That's what Jehoshaphat did. And he even did some good things for the Lord. Look, no one is immune to this. But what happened? Jehoshaphat had a soft spot. The Bible says that Jehoshaphat made affinity with the house of Ahab. What does that mean? He got involved in a marriage through the house of Ahab. He developed a soft spot for a wicked, wicked man, a wicked king, and a wicked kingdom. He allowed that to, to, to get into his personal life and to influence the way that he thinks instead of standing on, no, no, this is, no, you're a wicked man. I don't have anything to do with you. I have anything to do with you. He says, nope, I'll help you fight your battles. Wrong. Supporting the ungodly, as we shouldn't be doing that. And who is more ungodly than what we see in Romans 1? I told you, look, this is not a pleasant subject. I don't like preaching this subject, but it is so important with how much garbage there is out there and how many lies there are and trying to trick you and trying to tell you that basically there are no real wicked people in this world. Or that the people who are wicked aren't really that wicked. Romans 1, we're going to jump down to the end of the passage here. Romans 1 explains how people that knew God, they glorified him not as God. They knew about God. This is, this is, again, this isn't, you know, your average unsaved person don't even really know. They've never heard the gospel, whatever. They don't know what it takes to be saved. These are people who know the gospel. They know what it takes to be saved. They know about God, but they choose to have nothing to do with him. They choose to worship and serve the creature more than the creator is blessed forever. That's what Romans 1 says. Again, it goes on and explains how God gives them over to a reprobate mind to do all these weird things, all these bad things. And then it gives this list. And this list is not explaining some of the things that some of the people do that are, that are reprobate, that are given over this reprobate mind. 
this is what they're all, this is everything like that, that they're about. Every single person who's reprobate from God, this defines them. This is, this, these are their attributes. You say, oh, but I've done this thing or that thing. That doesn't make you a reprobate because you've maybe commit murder, which is murders on his list. It's, it's a really bad sin, right? But that doesn't make you a reprobate. Or I've done things, you know, I, I've been proud or I've done this or I've done that. That's not the point of this list. This, this isn't saying that everyone who's ever done any one of these things is a reprobate. No, this is saying the reprobate is all of these things. Romans 1, 28. The Bible says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. So they didn't even want, they didn't even want to have God in their mind at all. I don't even want to think about God. I want to have nothing to do with God. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness. The people that, that knew God, glorify him, not as God, they didn't even want to retain God in their knowledge. Guess what? They end up being rejected and being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Who is more ungodly than these people that have all of these things as their attributes? These are not the people that we should be supporting ever in any fashion, in any way, shape, or form. These are the same people that are described in Judges 19 and in Genesis 19. I'm going to go to Judges 19 first and Genesis 19 if you want to follow along and look at these stories. These stories are not pleasant. I said, this isn't, this isn't um, a fun subject, but because it is being so widely promoted and we're told so much to just be tolerant and accepting of all of this filth, let's just look at what the Bible says about these people. Let's get a dose of reality. Let's not believe the propaganda and the lies. Let's just look to God's word for the truth. Judges 19. We're going to pick up at the point where there is this man and his concubine were passing through town. And they're on their way home. They're just trying to get home. But it's getting late. They, they turn into the city. They're going to they're gonna find a place to stay. They can't find anywhere to stay. So they're just going to stay in the street. They're going to stay outside. They're just going to sleep, camp out, and go and continue on their way. So a man's coming out of the field, and he says, oh, okay, he's like, you guys can't stay out here. You, you come with me, right? Come, come into my house. You, you can lodge with me tonight, and you can be on your way tomorrow. So they come in town. They're, they're eating dinner with this guy. And what happens? There's a mob outside. And they're demanding to bring the man, the visitor, the stranger, the guy that, that was just passing through town to be given over to them. Hey, give us that guy. Verse number 24, Judges 19. So what type of people are these that are, that are interested in a man? Sodomites? The homosexual? This, this, I mean, look, we're looking at these examples because these are the examples the Bible gives us. There are no other examples of sodomites or homosexuals that, that in any way is tolerable at all. The kings that did right, the kings of Israel, drove out the sodomites out of the land. They got them all out. That was good. They would say, you know, King Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he got rid of all the sodomites out of the land. Like, that was a good thing. We see here why. Why is that a good thing? 
Well, Romans 1 already explained because they're full of all this stuff. They're full of all wickedness. That is what they are. They've already been given over to the reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. But in Judges 19, verse 24, we're going to start reading here. The, this, the, the man that, who invited these people in is pleading with them now. He says, behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. So he's trying to appease them and saying, here's my daughter. A maiden means she's a virgin. She's a young woman who's a virgin, you'd, you'd have my daughter and his concubine. But, you know, because basically, because how filthy and weird and sick is that for a man? He's like, it, it's already bad. And look, he shouldn't be offering up anybody to go and, 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 and be forced, to go and be abused. That's wrong. But he's saying if anything has to happen, at least, I mean, don't make it that bad to where it's a guy. I mean, like, to where it's just a guy getting abused like that. He says, that's just, that's just, just really bad and unmanageable. Behold, here is my daughter, Mary and his concubine, and them I will bring out now and humble ye them and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man, do not so vile a thing, so wicked and disgusting a thing. But the men would not hearken to him. So the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them, and they knew her. And of course, when the Bible says no, you know, it's, it's like when Adam knew Eve. It's not, it's not a very explicit book in that regard. So it's a wholesome book, but it's explaining what they did to her. They knew her and abused her all the night until the morning. These people are like animals. They're insatiable. They're unmerciful. You, you could go back and read the, the attributes in Romans chapter 1 and apply that to this story. And guess what you'll find? Oh, that matches perfectly. There is no mercy with them. They're not satisfied. They're implacable. They're full of murder. They're full of envy. They're going, they, they don't have natural affection. They abused her all night until the morning, and when the day began to spring, they let her go. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day and fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was till it was light, and her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. And behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house, and her hands were upon the threshold. And he said unto her, Up and let us be going, but none answered. Then the man took her upon an ass, and the man rose up and got him to his place. She died. They abused her to death. How tort, I mean, people force other people Unfortunately, it happens way too frequently than it ought to. But they abused her and forced her to death. I mean, how wicked is that? These are enemies. These are really, really, really wicked people. And the guy went and, and, and you know, and, and he, he sent out to all of Israel to come and say, look, we got to deal with this. This is not acceptable. This is not tolerable. They wanted to do that to him. Not that she's any less valuable, but that's just how disgusting and perverted they are. And they had to come up and fight against them and get them out. And they, they were doing the right thing. Because when someone is, look, when someone's that sick and twisted in the head, I, I don't know why, you know, this country, or maybe it's probably because there's a spiritual wickedness in high places. People can't get it through their heads. You don't, you don't correct these people. There is no rehabilitation. When someone's mind has gone so low as to think that, hey, I'm going to go, let's go rape someone of the same gender. Let's go after some kids. You don't fix that. There is no hope for that person. You need to put a bullet in their head and put them down as, as a filthy beast that they are. The Bible refers to them as natural brute beasts. So don't, don't get upset with me calling them animals because that's exactly what they are. And you can't reason with an animal. They're predators. You could hear all the interviews with these people, these pedophiles, these perverts, these psychopath killers that go and, and torture people and do these weird things. And they say, they're just going to do it again. And they're going to do it again and again. And the only time they don't do is when, is when it's going to be bad for them, like getting caught. But they're just going to do it again anyways. They're going to keep on doing it because 
They're sick, they're perverted, they're twisted, and they're wicked in their heart, and you can't change that. They're already given over to reprobate mind. They're already children of the devil. Done. Genesis 19 is the other example that we have, and it's amazing how we have two witnesses here in God's word. God chose to, to devote. Look, this, this book isn't very big overall. Not that big. We think of all the things in the world that God could choose to give unto us as wisdom, as knowledge, as things that we need to know. He's given us Genesis 19 and Judges 19 and Romans 1 and Jude and 2 Peter chapter 2 and so many other places to give us a warning and understanding of these wicked people and what they do so that we won't be deceived, so that we won't be tricked. Because our natural inclination and it's not a bad thing. Our natural inclination is to give people the benefit of the doubt, right? Assume that people are kind of like you, right? You're not, I would be willing to bet that no one in this room is planning and planning to hurt people. That's not who you, I mean, it's never been who you are. Before or after you're saved, that's not who you were. So it's hard to even grasp that there are people like that out there. And our natural inclination is just to be like, well, you know, you know, because we can't fathom how people can be like that, it's easier for us to just allow these people in. That's why we need to have it reinforced. No, these people exist. They're real. They're out there. They're destroying people all the time. And we need to be on guard if we want to protect our children and protect those that are important to us. And not even just our children, adults. I mean, these were adults in these stories. The man and his concubine, it's a, 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 basically a husband and wife. It's his living girlfriend or whatever. It's his servant. They're, they're, they're adults. We're going to see in Genesis 19, it's, it's the story of, of Sodom. What happens in this story? We have the angels come into town. Very familiar story. The angels come into town to go and speak to Lot, right? So Lot says, hey, come on in. You know, they come in his house, he, he's feeding them, he's, you know, he's, he's being hospitable to this. And what happens in Genesis 19? Hey, we saw those guys come into town. Bring, bring them out to us, what? That we may know them. The same thing that happened in Judges 19 is happening in Genesis 19. Look at verse number 4. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young. Old and young. The young, the young aren't even, you know, not a part of this. They are a part of this. Why? Because they're predators. Because the Sodomites... Men of Sodom, that's what a Sodomite is, or anyone who's like this, anyone who goes after their, their strange flesh, they recruit from a young age. And look, you don't even need the Bible to tell this, tell this to you. This is like common knowledge. When you find these Sodomites, they all have these, these histories of abuse. They're all molested as, as children. Now, not everyone, thank God, that's a molested becomes a Sodomite. Some people actually grow up and, and try to do their best to live a normal life, and they don't go after and prey upon other people. But many of them that are molested as children, they become predators themselves. That's how they operate. They, they twist people's minds from a young age and get them to hate God for allowing such a thing to happen to them. And unfortunately, in our society... We're allowing this to happen because we're not doing what the Bible says we ought to be doing to them when they get caught. We're slapping them on the wrist and sending them into a jail to get, you know, three squares a day and then sending them out after a couple years and go right back out on the street and go right back out and defile more people instead of ending their life and just stopping that person from ever doing that again. Genesis 19, 4, but before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people. 
from every quarter. This is what the whole town of Sodom was, do, was, was into and what they were doing. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. You say, well, why don't we see this happening so much today? Because it hasn't spread as far as it has in Sodom or as far as it has in Judges 19 story where they feel emboldened enough to be able to get away with doing something like that. Because once they have the numbers, what's going to stop them from doing that? They have to be a little bit more subtle about it now, but they're still out there defiling. They're still out there going to destroy. They're still out there doing wicked things. These people, if they didn't have the numbers, would still be the same way. That's the way that they are. They're wicked to the bone. They're wicked at heart. They're enemies. But here, hey, it's all the men of the city. They've all been, been given over into this. And, uh, and they're calling out now for these guys. Hey, we want to know these guys. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, and look, he's going to do the same thing. He's going to offer up his daughters. And again, look, this is wrong. I'm not saying it's right to offer up anybody. Now, we ought to be like, no, you're not getting anybody in my house. And you're going to have to kill me, if, you know, to get to anyone. We ought to be defending to the death on, on this stuff. But, you know, you know he, he, he didn't know what to do. And he says, here, behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you. And do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. In, Gen in Judges 19, they ended up being satisfied by abusing and killing a woman there. But that was not going to satisfy them in, in, in Sodom. They're saying, no. This is verse 9. They said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came into sojourn and he will needs be a judge. Funny how things don't change. Who is, who is most loudly in our world today telling Christians, don't judge. Hey, don't judge me oh, don't judge me, then the sodomites. Saying, oh, you, who are you to judge? Oh, you're a sinner too. You, you can't judge me. It's what they were saying a lot. They're saying, look, don't do so wicked a thing. Don't do so vile a thing. This is disgusting. Don't do that. Oh, now you're going to judge what we do? Yes. Yes, I am going to judge. Yes, because God gave me the judgment. God already judged. He decided. This isn't me just deciding on my own what's right and what's wrong. This is me saying, God already said what's right and wrong. It's here. He calls it vile. He calls it abominable. He calls it wicked. So I'm going to do the same thing. When the Bible tells us not to judge, it says not to judge as a hypocrite, don't do the things and be guilty of the same things you're judging. Read Matthew chapter 7. That's what it's talking about. It doesn't just say judge not. It says judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you meet, ye shall be, you shall be measured to you again. That whatever judgment you use, hey, just be aware that the same, the same thing's going to apply to you. Right? That's what it's saying. So when we judge, hey, I don't have a problem judging according to God's judgment and, and saying that the sodomite is worthy of a death penalty because that's what God said. I'm not being a hypocrite in that judgment. But this is what they said to him. They said, oh, now you're going to be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee? Did they know they were going to do bad things? Yes, they did because they said, we're going to do worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. They were going to have, they, they were going to do this no matter what. They had it in their heart. They're just, they're going to get these guys and have their way with them. And that's how wicked they were. And basically the angels had to save them. They had to pull Lot in. They blind them, you know, and, they, they, and, and even when they're blinded, they're still trying to find the door. They're like trying to get in, even though they can't see because they're driven by their wickedness in their heart. 
The Bible is crystal clear on these people, on what their motivations are, on who they are, and what they're doing, and how wicked their heart is. And I don't want anybody to misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm talking about the homosexual today. I'm talking about the person who is burned in their lust towards another man. This is how the Bible describes these people. And you say, oh, that's the old, you know, in the Old Testament here in Genesis, Genesis 19, how God fixed that problem. He rained fire and brimstone upon, upon the town. And all he did was pull out Lot and his family because Lot was the only person that was saved in the entire town. Why? Because the Sodomites were reprobate. They were rejected. They were given over this reprobate mind. It doesn't mean they never had a choice. It doesn't mean that God didn't love them. God loved them. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. God loves, loved everybody at one point. When people are born in this world, hey, God loves that person. But there gets a point where people decide what they're going to do. There gets a point where people are going to decide whether or not they're going to reject God or not. And these people chose to reject the Lord. And the Bible says in the New Testament, in Jude verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. I'm saying this, this event that happened in the Old Testament, it's applicable in the New Testament for us to learn from. And he's saying, look, that's an example. This is how God feels about that. His attitude hasn't changed. It hasn't changed in the New Testament when Jesus Christ came that all of a sudden these people now are somehow different in their heart. No, they're not. Let's take heed to the warning and let's not be double-minded about, especially on this issue, of kind of be wavering and be back and forth. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. The world is doing everything it can to get people to accept the worst kinds of perversion. And that's a fact. That's the world. But we have a zero-tolerance policy here. Zero. In God's house and among God's people, there ought to be a zero-tolerance policy. Anytime I see or hear anyone trying to give some slack or try to explain away what some sodomite perverts do. I'm going to see one or two things. Either someone who's just really, really ignorant and maybe a new believer and doesn't know any better because they've been brainwashed, or someone who's just a total enemy. And it's something that needs to be corrected immediately. And I'm not saying there's anybody that, that has this problem. I'm just These are things that I like to do a little bit more frequently these days because I want to make sure that, that we can have a safe place for children and for ourselves and not allow enemies in to infiltrate and to, and to defile. It's all, I mean, think about it. Think about how many stories you've heard of kids being defiled. And I mean, I can't, I can't even count. Oh, it was the uncle. It was the stepdad, it was this, you know, these people, they, I never would have thought that they would do this thing. Never would have thought it was that person. Never would, you know, that's always who it is. Don't be naive. Now look, I'm not saying you're always going to know where the wicked person is because we're not. Judas was wicked and the disciples didn't even know. Okay, they do creep in. We need to be aware of that. But there are plenty of people who already show their hand, who already show what's in their heart. And as Romans 1 shows, have already been given over and demonstrate through their unnatural affections and their vile affections that, hey, let's stay away from that person because they're publicizing it and I'm not going to have them get anywhere near my children. You know, there's things, and turn if you would to Deuteronomy 13. It's the last place we're turning to when we're done. Deuteronomy 13. There are things in this life that we have to deal with that are not pleasant at all, and this is one of them, unfortunately. Like I said, you know, I, I preached a really positive message this morning and, uh, about, you know, Jesus Christ and how great it is that he was born and, and did everything for us, and, and, you know, we love him for that. But I love him also for giving us instruction and for, and for giving us all these words and all these stories 
to help us understand, to keep us safe. Because that's the goal. The goal is, is to keep us safe. We have to deal with things that are not pleasant as part of life. And in those situations especially, we want to we make sure we're doing the right thing because those are the most likely situations for us to fail when, it, when there's something difficult, when there's something that makes us uncomfortable, when, when there's these, these unpleasant situations. You know, like the Bible says, just, just a real quick example, um, you know, when someone's backbiting, in the book of Proverbs, you know, if, if, you, if you come across someone who's, who's spreading rumors and lies and kind of talking bad about people behind their backs, what we're supposed to do is, is, is drive that away with an angry countenance. We're supposed to give that person a dirty look and basically not tolerate that and not accept that. Now, that could be uncomfortable to do, right? Because you're, you're, you're making a stand and, and you're doing something that, you know, if, if you're not that strong-willed of a person or whatever, you, you might want to just kind of ignore it and brush it aside. But no, if you're going to do the right thing, the Bible says, you know what, you're going to rebuke that and you're going you're gonna to not allow that in your, you know, to continue on in your presence. And that might make you uncomfortable. So it's easier for people to not do the right thing because they don't want to do anything because they just kind of feel awkward and maybe they're a little bit unsure of themselves. I don't know what to do. I, don't, I wish this person wasn't saying this, but I don't really know what to do. Instead of just saying, no, hey, look, don't do that. Don't say that. Don't talk bad about this person. They're not here. You're not, you can't just come and start spreading rumors and lies. That's one example. Here's an even more extreme example, though, of something that could be very, very unpleasant. And, and according to the Old Testament law, this is, this is the way that God wanted things to be. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse number 6, the Bible reads, If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul. These are people who are really, really close to you. Entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers. Namely, of the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee, or far off from thee, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. Thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, Okay. So he's saying, if people who are really close to you say, hey, let's go, let's go serve some other God. You know, let's forget the Lord. Let's, let's go worship this other God. He's saying, from one end to the other, I don't care who the God is or where he's from or anything like that. He says, first of all, don't consent or listen to him. He says, neither shall thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him. Say, don't hide him. He's like, I don't care if it's your son, your daughter, your wife. He's saying, don't hide that person. Don't cover up their wickedness and what they're doing. Verse 9, but thou shalt surely kill him. I guarantee you this passage is not getting preached very often anywhere across America. Why? It's, a, it's, it, it's hard to, to accept. But look, look, this is God. I, I didn't write this book. But I'm going to preach it. I love God's word. And this is what we need to understand. This is what God was commanding. Now, did everybody follow this? I'm sure they didn't. But this is what God was saying. He says, but thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death and afterwards the hand of all the people. This is how God wants us to view certain sins. And in this case, it was a sin of just going and, and completely forsaking the Lord and worshiping another God is a false god which isn't that what romans 1 says the sodomites did they rejected the lord and they worshiped and served the creature more than the creator they, they made up their own gods they made they, they became idolatrous verse 10 and thou shalt stone him with stones that he died because he hath sought to thrust thee away from the lord thy god which brought thee out of the land of egypt from the house of bondage and all israel shall hear and fear and shall do no more any such wickedness as this is among you. So God has a purpose for having such a very definitive and strong judgment against something like that. He's saying, I don't want this to happen ever. So if it happens one time, I want you to be able to do this and go through with it and, and do this execution so that no one will ever even think about trying to draw people away from serving the Lord. It's what the Bible says. 
Part of the law was requiring the people to carry out the execution of those worthy of death. Getting your hands right into it. You have to really hate sin and really love God's law in order to, to, to do something like that. Don't overlook this fact in God's perfect law. There's no soft spot for wickedness in God's law. Now look, I know we're not saved through the law, but these are laws that God gave for the land to be run and how they were supposed to be, how things are supposed to be handled. So even if someone close to you was guilty in, th in this situation, you know, we ought to love God and his ways more. So unfortunately, so many people these days, they have somebody that may be close to them that fits the bill of a Romans 1. And you don't want to think about it because it makes you uncomfortable. But don't, you know, just overlook it. And dead sure, I would never allow them around any children ever. We see, I mean, the Bible gives enough examples of this. I, I, don't, think, I don't think it's unclear at all. I think it's Chris. I got, God intended it for it to be clear for us because it's so important. And I'm, I'm not going to tolerate, look, I, like I said, I, I don't think, you know, I don't know anybody that, who's secretly promoting sodomites or anything like that that comes here, but uh, we're not going to tolerate it. There's a zero tolerance policy on this. Because it is so serious. Because, I mean, this, this is grave. This is, this is a very serious, sobering matter. And, um, you know, and the people that are out there, there's, there, we, got a, we got a DVD. I think there's still at least one back there. It's called uh, Burn That Way. After all, there's a, there is, you know, this, this wolf that's crept into Baptist churches. And I have no problems calling this man a wolf. Now look, that's strong language. You call someone a wolf because a wolf in sheep's clothing is someone who's wicked and ravenous on the inside and on the outside they're trying to play the sheep and trying to get, gain your confidence. There is a man that's a wolf. His name's Johnny Nixon. And he has this ministry. It's called Born That Way Ministries. Born That Way. Exactly what the sodomites are saying. Hey, I was born this way. Hey, God made me this way. No, look. You weren't born that way. You were born natural and you rejected God and God gave you over to that reprobate mind to do those things which are not natural and not convenient. But he's out there trying to say, oh no, no, they're misunderstood. These people who are, are sodomites have become confused because they were actually born eunuchs. And he says that they didn't have any type of... of attraction to anybody because that's the way God made them. Now look, if there are people that, and I don't even accept that premise, but if there are people that exist that don't have a natural affection for either gender, male nor female, why would they be drawn to become a homosexual? That doesn't make any sense. You don't go from not having an attraction to all of a sudden having an attraction being burned in your lust for someone of the same gender. That's ridiculous. And he's saying, oh yeah, people, churches and other people have driven these people away. Look, the guy's got a soft spot and he's targeting the sodomites and he's trying to tell you how they're misunderstood and how they're really born eunuchs and all this other stuff. And they've, made, they've made bad choices and everything else. He's an enemy because he's trying to get these people into the churches and he's trying to, to change the way that you view this severe wickedness in your heart and try to become more tolerant and accepting of it. That's an enemy. And people who are going to line up with him and line up with that garbage is an enemy also. We're not going to bring that in here ever. We're going to call it out. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words and the clear instruction, dear God. I pray that this message is received uh, uh, well into our hearts, dear Lord. I, I know, I'm sure that nobody here likes to, to think about these things. I know I don't, dear God, but they happen. We live in a really wicked, perverted world. God, we ask for your protection just as you protected Lot. And um, 
I pray that you would please watch over our church, watch over our families, watch over our children, dear Lord. Help us to have our own watchful eyes over them, but that um, we know that there's times they get out of our sight, dear God, and we just ask for you to, to watch over them, that they wouldn't be defiled. Lord, help us to fight against this surge of wickedness in this country. Help us to be able to identify the enemies and not to be soft towards them and not to, to back off or, or relent on, on our stand when it comes to this issue, dear Lord. Help us to be strong. Help us to just be bold and strong and strengthen us, dear Lord, to, to do that which is right and to stand for righteousness when everyone around us is, is trying to push wickedness, dear Lord. In Jesus, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.